Well, thank you all for being here this evening. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have David Lampton, Professor Lampton, with us tonight. He has been an observer of China and of all things Asia, at least until high school, since high school. I found out earlier tonight, and uh, as a result, of course, he has had multiple opportunities both to travel to the region, but to also observe it through its multiple ver uh, evolutions and, and these dramatic changes that have occurred since the normalization with the United States. Um, I'm going to jump right into it because we are all watching our TV screens, and one of the things that is most apparent to anyone who's noticing the China news these days is that there are demonstrations currently in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, which was supposed to be allowed to evolve until 2047 on its own path, the 50-year agreement that was signed with the British, and yet when we look at our TV screens, we see people in shopping malls demonstrating, we sometimes see Molotov cocktails in the streets, we at times even have images of policemen wielding weapons. What is going on in Hong Kong and where will this force or allow the, pub the People's Republic of China to go? Well, first of all, I started out my career living in Hong Kong under the British. And um, this was an extremely poor city with a class of rich, but extremely poor people who had fled the Cultural Revolution that was underway in China. And um, these were people who fled oppression. And some of the bravest people I ever met were those people I interviewed for my first book on China. And this town is now, Hong Kong, is full of descendants of these people. And so the immediate cause was really the proposal by the chief executive to propose an extradition treaty with the People's Republic of China, which was a place, obviously, many of either these people or their uh, children uh, had fled. And so, and uh, of course, everybody in Hong Kong has family back in China. They are aware that things are tightening up in China, to put it delicately. Uh, and so the idea of being extradited back to that judicial system was not welcome. And in fact, I've been to Hong Kong several times and asked, what on earth were you thinking when you proposed this to begin with? And that's a whole interesting story. The answer is I think they've concluded they made a mistake to propose this. But once a political leader, any political leader takes a stand, they have a big investment in not being proven wrong, and that's even more so, I think, in uh, the Chinese political setting. We see so, that in Brexit these right. days. <laughs> yes, once what? a politician makes a move that turns out to be expensive, they tend to want to put more <laughs> behind that decision to prove they were right. Often that just exaggerates the eventual cost when you change. So I think that's the immediate cause. Underneath it, of course, like all things, there are many reasons something so massive happens. Uh, first of all, there was a long history of missteps by previous chief executives before the pre present one, Carrie Lam, ever came along. And there have been a series of trying, China trying to shape the curricula for civic education in Hong Kong. There's been uh, attempts to pass a security law that aroused the same anxiety. So there was a history. So this latest proposal came along against a background. Uh, thirdly, uh, the uh, joint declaration and the basic law were a set of agreements in 19, that took effect in effect 1997 with a handover. Uh, and uh, that promised a high degree of autonomy, and it said that there would be universal suffrage uh, basically after 2015, but it didn't specify what universal suffrage meant, how it would be implemented, and on what time schedule. And in 2014 and 15, there were massive demonstrations at that time called the Umbrella Movement. Yes. And in fact, the uh, students and others, it's not just a student movement, uh, rejected what the PRC made as a 
what we'll say, a compromise proposal. If you had 100 yards on the football field, it went from the goal line to the 20-yard line. It didn't go to the 50-yard line. It surely didn't go to the other goal. It was not satisfactory to the protesters. And so Beijing says, you heard our offer. There's nothing forward. Uh, so there is no plan for the future now. Before 2015, there was. China has now said that the joint declaration is a historic document, meaning no longer in effect. Mm -hmm. So you just have a long history of frustration. The final thing is that Hong Kong's growth uh, has not been distributed. Like everywhere else in the world, globalization produced huge inequalities. It also produced huge growth, and probably 80, 90 percent of people benefited, but there are in all of these societies a, a chunk of people who did not benefit. In Hong Kong, this is true, and in many cases, it's young people that can't afford housing. They fear for not getting good jobs. Many of them are competing with mainland skills. Uh, their Cantonese language, they feel, is dis discriminated against by the mainlanders coming in and speaking Mandarin. So it's a real can of worms. Uh, but you'd have to say that the precipitating factor has been a series of missteps by the chief executives who really, I think, uh, are uh, pretty responsive to Beijing. Right. And as you point out, the demands are getting greater on both sides because those that one singular demand earlier, the one on extradition, has turned into the five demands. Exactly. Uh, one of which is the extradition issue. And, uh, and so we are in this moment where we see what we see in terms of the violence, the, the escalation, the intransigence on both ends of right. what the demands are. So how do we then, as outside observers, take a look at that and say, well, what are the policy options or what are the potential options for the leadership in Beijing and the leadership in Hong Kong, yeah. if we can still distinguish them, for resolving this in some way? Well, it's hard for a superpower to say there's not much we can do, but if you, when you get to the end of the answer, we have limited options that really will help the people of Hong Kong. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. I live there. I have great feeling, but I think that's the, in the end point answer. We can easily do more harm than good. Now, if you think that's just sort of a, this American's answer to that, remember Margaret Thatcher. She went in the early 80s to, Hong Kong, uh, to China, talked to Deng Xiaoping, and Deng Xiaoping basically said, we are taking back Hong Kong in 1997. There's nothing you can do about it, but we'll negotiate how that happens. Mm -hmm. And so the period from the early 80s on to 1997 was that negotiation. Uh, and why could the Iron Lady do nothing? Well, very simply, it's a, it, it's a very small place on the f cheek of China. Yes. Uh, and uh, the water, the vegetables, the electricity, almost everything necessary to sustain a city comes from a few miles up the, the Pearl River from the People's Republic of China. And so China could, in a flick, take it over, bring it to its knees economically, and of course, that isn't even to mention all of the trade, the re-exports, exports through Hong Kong to the rest of the world, exports from the rest of the world through Hong Kong, and so on. So even Margaret Thatcher realized China, Britain would have to negotiate with China and get the best deal, but in the end, this was reverting to China. So it really is just a basic understanding of realpolitik, understanding how geopolitics works, recognizing that we are dealing with a great power that has regional interests, has its perception of its own sovereignty, of its own territory, and that those on the outside really have to abide ultimately by the sheer might and money and mind, as you put in your yeah. book, of the larger People's Republic of China? And I would say yes. That's 90% of what I would say. But I think there's an important 10%, and that is other political systems, let's just take the American political system, aren't all full of realists. There are people who have values or have family or have personal commitment, and they are attached 
to a certain more democratic liberal evolution. And they approach our institutions, most often Congress, and you will just find last week to, or earlier this week, two US senators uh, in Hong Kong, one dressing up as a protester to show his solidarity with the protesters. And there's all sorts of legislation working itself through the House. Uh, and it was, was headed for the Senate, and I wouldn't be surprised if either all or most passes. And then the president will have to decide, is he going to be a realist, or is he going to just uh, go along? And it might be Congress could even override a veto. Uh, but these, uh, l these pieces of legislation uh, require State Department reports. Uh, there's one thing, investigation every year on the autonomy and human rights. Uh, but also proposed to inflict sanctions on Chinese leaders who are held responsible for the decline in human rights. And I mean, practically speaking, you have to ask, well, now how are we going to measure all of this? And how are we going to fix responsibility on individuals? And uh, what will be the reaction of China? So anyway, realism doesn't necessarily the total explanation for what the U.S. Congress does. Sure. Well, you mentioned the president and you mentioned his actions and potential actions. Mm -hmm. And as we sit here, we are uh, probably in an administration that has had more to say about China than any of the more recent administrations since Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly in a much more assertive way, uh, with a very uh, decided perception of an imbalance that exists between the relationship uh, between the United States and China. And so he has that frame that he is uh, projecting on a regular basis to the American people around which he is deciding certain policies. But what is it that we as the public don't get about China in this current environment? What is it that if we understood differently than what the president or than how the president is currently telling us that this relationship is, uh, is, is, is uh, evolving? How would we, would we be reacting in the same way? Would, would tariffs, for instance, a, a trade war be the, uh, the logical policy step for the United States to take? Or if we understood something differently, would, sh would or should the United States approach this relationship in a different way? Well, that's a, a lot of sub-questions yes, in is. there. Okay, let's just start with <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want us to know. <laughs> but I would say, uh, in some sense, the pro not all, uh, of course, academics are often inclined to say you don't perceive the situation correctly, you haven't framed it correctly, and if you did, you might have a different understanding. I believe that's often the case. But often, or at least sometimes, you have a problem bec precisely because people do understand the situation. Mm -hmm. So you can end up in trouble through either ignorance yes. or, in fact, a correct perception that something's not in your interest. And I would say we have both things going on here in terms of correctly understanding. I think the popular understanding that um, China had since Mao Zedong and the end of the Cultural Revolution and Nixon going to China gradually, overall, with ups and downs, was moving in a somewhat more liberal and certainly more market-based directive a direction, and that the leaders were progressively, let us say, one uh, more consensus-oriented leaders. I think that's a, a basically correct understanding, and Xi Jinping, the current leader, has come along, and we could talk about it, reversed most of those trends to various degrees for reasons that are adequate to him but not congenial to us. Mm -hmm. And I think we understand that, and we don't, generally speaking, like it. So that, that's sort of background factor one. Now, on the trade war, uh, I think often there's a, I've always believed that a, a, a requirement for graduating from high school ought to be Econ 101 <laughs> for people, right? I think it's the single most useful thing you know, just to understanding the world. Uh, and, but uh, President Trump, and there are others that have been in the past, I'm not, but he is our president and he is acting on this, uh, has defined the trade problem as the trade deficit. He's got an easy indicator. And if you look at that trade deficit, 
it has just done nothing but go up since 1985. It's just a straight line way up. Uh, now, there are lots of reasons that's happening, and we could get into it. But the, the underlying issue is, does the trade deficit, is it, as, as it, is it a problem? Or is it as big a problem? And I think the trade of, between the United States and China is not nearly as out of balance if you had a correct understanding, of, in my view, of what balance is. And let me just identify a couple of things. The trade balance is in goods, goods. Well, where are services? The United States sells about $50 billion in services to China, lawyers, consultants, insurance, and so on. Big category, but the trade deficit doesn't even measure it. But it's very important to the Deloitte, Touches, and all of the companies that are, you know, McKinsey and all of these. Okay, one big item. There's a $260 billion item not in that. All these American companies investing in the PRC, uh, multinational corporations with production capacity in China or assembly capacity, they produce goods. Some are shipped to the United States. But $260 billion is goes out the back door to China. It's sales in China. They're making money. And it's not in the trade statistics. There's another one that's probably 10 to $20 billion is Hong Kong. The way Hong Kong's treated is everything China sends to Hong Kong and goes on to the US is a Chinese export to us. Everything we send to China via Hong Kong is an export to Hong Kong. Well, what I'm trying to say is if you subtract out just these big conceptual gaps, the trade balance is imbalance, not so big. And then there's a whole other part of this, and that is we've got trade deficits with darn near everybody in the world. So, you know, you've got to ask, well, is China in that respect different? Uh, but in any case, the, the global trade balance in Asia, if you took all of the countries and Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, that export, uh, used to export a lot to us, they now are exporting to China. It's getting assembled there, and that's coming to us from China. So our trade deficit with many others in Asia has dropped, but China's risen. But if you ask, what's our trade deficit with Asia? It's pretty much the same. It's just reallocated where things are being assembled because the trade rules require the last place of final assembly, in effect, pays all the value or gets credited for all the export value. So what I'm really trying to say is I don't think the trade situation required anything like this. So an overreaction by the President of the United States yes, and, and a policy that is really punitive to the people of the United States as a result, well, as, as tariffs function. Sure. I mean, I, his statement that the Chinese are going to pay the tariff is just so not in accordance with reality. American consumers are. Now, as they go up, you know, the Chinese may eat a little at the beginning, and maybe the middlemen will eat a little, and the consumer will pay a little. But the longer this goes on, everybody's getting closer to the bone. And eventually, if this goes on, the consumer is going to pay a lot. And is it going to be the wealthy consumers? Yes, but wealthy people can aff afford more, right? So what it's going to do, it's going to hit the people that are, you know, Walmart and Target. These are the people that are going to get, get hit with this. And, you know, it, the, the, the president, uh, one other thing is, if you look at agricultural exports, soybeans, we export to China about $13 billion in soybeans prior to the last two years. Those are absolutely essential exports to uh, farmers in Iowa. Remember the, the current, uh, Terry Branscombe? Yes, the, our uh, got, Right. He used to say two out of three rows of soybeans in Iowa go to, go to China. Yeah. 
Well, now those have, exports have fallen about 95% in the last two years. And what's happening is the U.S. government then has to subsidize those farmers. And we're, we've appropriated already, I believe, about 12 or 13 billion, and there's more in the pipeline. So we have essentially a quote, you know, a, uh, an administration opposed to subsidies that has imposed tariffs that have hurt farmers that demand subsidies. So, so what I would say is in some sense, yes, we understand what's going on big picture in China. And we understand about building islands in the South China Sea. And we don't like that. And we probably shouldn't like it. But on the trade thing, I think we just, at least the policy is not being guided by sound economics. So uh, what I hear is a prescription of math classes for everyone in the U.S. government, <laughs> in particular for those in the White House, and an understanding, a little, a little better reckoning of what it is that's actually happening on the trade yeah. function. But, but Can I you, put yeah, one please. parenthesis there? I, I don't want what I said to be exculpatory for China across the whole range of trade issues. Okay, have at Yeah, intellectual <laughs> property. Yes. Indefensible. Uh, and by that, the you mean the acquisition, the forced uh, transition uh, or tra uh, handing over of intellectual property. Theft and so on. So there's, there are zones within the trade realm that we, and also, why should China's, uh, you know, Baidu and its search engines and its uh, social media have full access to the United States market and Google and Facebook can't even put a toe practically into China. So there are lots of legitimate grievances we have. And I think what, rather than make the deficit the, the be all and end all, which I think is not a sound approach, I would think the sound approach is for us to talk about reciprocity. Um, uh, the granting of equal access and treatment by both countries to the others. Now, it, it's a little difficult because China's five times as big as we are, right? And so nothing's going to ever be quite equal <laughs> with China. But I think th the principle of reciprocity and uh, reciprocal treatment for treatment provided on a, on a, a, a fair basis is a, is a much more sound concept right. for our, our policy. But that's been really the main grievance from the United States yeah. and others, by the way, not just the U.S., those in the EU, saying that, in fact, we have been seeking reciprocity right. and that the argument oftentimes that comes from the PRC is that, well, we are a developing nation versus you who are already developed, who have already achieved high levels of, in, of industrialization and, in fact, post-industrialization, and therefore we're catching up and cannot operate on a level playing field since we need to also achieve both an educational capital, in, in intellectual capital, uh, be able to develop our industrial base, and achieve not only size in terms of population, but heft in terms of GDP and of industrial output. Right. And in 1972, when Richard Nixon went to China, and China was poorer than Haiti in per capita terms, poorer than Cambodia, that, I'd, that line of thinking cut some ice. Yes. And in fact, the American tradition, we have a long, I would say, philanthropic tradition the Rockefellers and the Looses and Christian missionaries. And um, there's been a great philanthropic aspect. And I remember Jimmy Carter's Secretary of Treasury, Mike Blumenthal. Mm -hmm. He uh, was a Jewish person, and his family had been driven out of Europe, and the only place beyond the United States that they could go was Shanghai. Right. Uh, and in any case, uh, so when he became Treasury Secretary and Secretary uh, President Carter decided to normalize, you had a very powerful... President Carter himself had gone to China after World War II. He talked about putting money in tin cups on Sundays at church for the Chinese. So there's we a big impulse to the early desire to help China and op, open up school. Soviets 
when we had students come to the Soviet Union, it was one Soviet student for one American. Carter said, China can send as many students as it wants as long as the U.S. government's not paying for it. Right, and today Basically, we have 361,000 right, exactly. higher education So I, could, I students. would say Americans can feel very good that I think we contributed. The hard work of the Chinese people is the most explanation for their success. But America really did a lot. And I don't think we have to apologize with the proposition that China's made enormous progress and the special deals that got cut after China coming out of the Cultural Revolution, those days are over. Right. And so from you know? the president's perspective, again, not to belabor it, but yeah. to say, and he's saying, you know, he has this unique negotiating style, which is which he calls maximalist, right? <laughs> uh, and all he would say is, look, I'm just asking for everything so that I can get something. This would be his argument, maybe right. within closed doors. But it's also been his argument in terms of why, how he deals with North Korea, how he deals with almost any other negotiating partner, whether domestic or foreign. Right. Uh, we, we, we can certainly agree that is his style. Yes. <laughs> now that we want to ask, is that the only style? Clearly not. Yes. And is it been effective thus far? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Probably not, but we might disagree on that. Uh, but I think my much more limited, low-level experience dealing with universities on exchange programs and public uh, programs and so forth is that you, you, meaning the negotiator on this side, have to have a set of priorities. What do I want more than what do I want? Uh, what else there is? I'm not going to get everything. So what do I actually value? And what am I willing to trade off? And so my approach, and he's the billionaire and I'm not, so maybe, <laughs> <laughs> or millionaire. Uh, so uh, we have to keep that in mind. But I think uh, the Chinese are reluctant to engage in a negotiation when they don't think they have a map of the other guy's priority list. So I think you get... Uh, more more efficiently with less friction by just actually being fairly straightforward and say, these are our, what we would like. This is what we got to get. If, if that's not feasible, then let's just terminate the discussions for now and we'll come back to the issues or we'll reframe it or something else. But I think clarity of what you want, the American system, in my view, is a treadmill of demand. We're a demand-making machine. Uh, if Congress gets this, they want that. And that's, that represents interest groups and it's the nature of our system. But there is never a point at which we're satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> and the Chinese have trouble dealing with that. They just want to buy some peace. If we do this, can we move on? Mm -hmm. And our system finds it very difficult to have a clear priority list and then say, okay, you do this and we'll get off your back for the next five years. So you're saying that it's <laughs> not really going to happen. A systemic issue, and that's yeah. true of our American system rather yeah. than sort of a cultural issue and how we approach negotiation or, or deal with our negotiating partner or some would say adversary. Right. But also, uh, I think the Chinese v uh, value, they don't always agree with it, but if they see that you're committed to something, more often than not, they'll accommodate it if they can. And one of the things I would say about President Trump is that I don't think the Chinese think he's necessarily committed. He, for instance, he call, is he committed to the one China policy or not? First thing he does before he's president is call Tsai Ing-wen, the president yes. of Taiwan. Right. I'm not necessarily criticizing that, but that was a big departure. Sure. And then he suggested to the Chinese, well, if you're not going to accommodate and help on Korea or you're not going to help on trade, well, then why should I, you know, observe the one China policy? Yes. Or in Hong Kong, maybe I'll get concerned about human rights in Hong Kong if you Chinese cut this deal on this trade thing, right? And so the Chinese see, we got human rights here, we got Korea on the table, we got one China policy. This is not an effective way to negotiate with them. So you have spent uh, many years in Washington as well, and those who are 
often policymakers call you and ask you your advice and, and call not on anymore. your experience. Well, maybe perhaps not <laughs> lately, yeah. but, it, but for years, yeah. uh, you were yeah. certainly a, and, and should be uh, one of those who is regularly referred to for your many years uh, in, the, in the field and for, with your experience. So if you were to be called upon, if not this administration, then the administration that follows, what, how would you then prioritize an approach and, and a system and a, and a series of, of issues for the United States in light of the changing military balance that is occurring within uh, not just uh, Asia, but throughout the world, but, but in particular right now in, in uh, Asia, recognizing the islands being built, the South China Sea, the questions of sovereignty in other nations, the North Korea issue, there's any number of issues that we're mm -hmm. dealing with. So you've got trade, you've got, as we've already discussed, you've got security issues, military issues. You have human rights issues, which you also mentioned earlier. How do you look at that list <laughs> and say, okay, number 46, you're now entering into the White House. You know, yeah. thankfully, I, I got a call and, and I've been asked to at least give my priority, priorities of how do we negotiate? How do we get to a point where what you have advocated for, which is ongoing engagement with China, recognizing that there is an interdependence in this world that we need to invest in and strengthen, how do you then set a list of, and what would that list look like? Well, f first of all, I'll concede a, a number of things here. First of all, if the other party had won, we'd have many of these problems, right? Because some of them actually pertain to our deeper national interests that both parties, despite all their differences, actually reflect. So I think we've got some deep issues that are going to be difficult for anybody with the best possible framework to deal with. And as and, you mentioned, a, yeah. a bipartisan consensus, it seems, on these very right. issues right now. In some sense, on China, we've got yes. more consensus than a lot of other issues, yes. really. In fact, there's an interesting poll out from the Pew that shows not only our attitudes becoming more negative towards China, dramatically so, but the view between Republicans, Democrats, and uh, independents is converging. It's almost identical, which has not been the case for the last 20 years, right. at least. So uh, we, we will have problems, and if we change presidents or whatever, or which of the 20 <laughs> Democrats win or whatever, uh, we're going to have problems. And there is no nirvana here. But if you're asking really what's kind of a framework to think about this, and I think what's happened, why this thing's fallen apart so fast, so broadly, is because our security relationship has deteriorated. I, I'm of the school that believes if you are worried about your security, everything else is secondary. And for a long time, coming out of that Cultural Revolution and China poorer than Haiti and all of that, China wasn't a threat. I remember the first time I went to China with a group of the National Academy of Sciences. And it was clear why China wanted us to come. It was steroid chemists. It was, it was birth control pills and, and uh, so forth. Uh, it was clear why China wanted us there. But I remember the scientists discussing, what do we have to learn from China? And the answer was nothing. So uh, at that point, you could afford to have a fairly philanthropic kind of attitude because there was no prospect of either commercial or, um, you know, security problems. But China now has had, you know, 40 years of 9.8 percent compounded annual growth. And uh, China's able to afford a rapidly increasing military budget. Uh, it's acquiring capabilities. Uh, some it's developed itself, some it's stolen right out of our own defense firms. But the point is that now China is capable of inflicting um, unacceptable damage on U.S. forces in the, uh, the Western Pacific. Yes, we just saw in yeah. the 70th uh, birthday party right. on October 1st right. the unveiling of a new ICBM. Right. So once that security relationship begins to go south, 
then you ask, well, what it goes into the economic realm? What technology is in our interest to sell China? If we're not willing to sell China the technology, then how can we let all their students be in labs with that technology here? So it spills, it immediately goes from security to economics to the educational realm. Uh, and I was at Hopkins, I'm now at Stanford, wouldn't propose to speak for them. But major research universities are highly dependent on Chinese and, and, and from Taiwan and South Korea and India. But Chinese are a big component of many of our technical departments and contribute to research programs, TAs, lab courses, uh, RAs, and all of this. So we have built foreign talent, our great comparative advantage has been we get the best brains in the world and we don't care what passport they have. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay unless you've got a security lens through which you're focusing. Then it, the passport matters. <laughs> And so we, I think the first thing we need to do is restore, we don't have a military to military dialogue with China anymore. We're not talking about the big strategic issues. We're not talking about, well, gee, does the US Navy really have to go within you know, 12.5 miles of the Chinese uh, coastline? Uh, China's now pushing its fleet out, and, and do they really need to circumnavigate Taiwan and some of the things? But the point is, we've got to get the security relationship. We have no arms control discussions. We just pulled out of the intermediate force treaty that governed missiles in Europe because we're worried about Russian. We're not, we're, we're not in any discussions I know of about arms control issues. I mean, we don't cooperate with China in space, whereas we had the Soyuz and uh, NASA cooperation. We're not doing things with China now that we did with the Soviet Union. So I think if I was king for a day, uh, I'd start out and try to see what we could do to stabilize security expectations. So it sounds like that's number one, number yeah. two, and number three is yeah. the security issue. and and. Just to also note, you said there's no military to military uh, cooperation at this le at the Not highest much. levels now, yeah. right? And but uh, you know, even speaking with some of the military leaders in the United States mm -hmm. about a while back, they would say, well, we would send our senior most uh, officers or or uh, secretary to try and have these discussions, and they were never. Uh, at a at an equal level in terms of the representation that came from the PRC. So they're even there again to return to your earlier argument of uh, needing to have reciprocity. Right. There seemed not to have been that reciprocity or that goodwill if in fact this was something that was sought from the side of the PRC. So I, I can understand. That's true. Yes. Um, uh, all of what you've said is is true. Uh, but there are among in the security our security yes. community there are even different views. There are some that thought the earlier efforts were pretty much a one way street. Mm -hmm. There were others that say, well, it was a one way street because for much of the period we're talking about, China didn't have much to show yeah. and didn't want to show its weakness for fear it would get. A, they didn't have any strengths, but they had lots of weaknesses, <laughs> and they didn't want us to know. Yeah. But now they are moving up in their capability, yeah. uh, and at least there's the uh, possibility that I think the Chinese are a little more confident of their capabilities, be a little more open, and I think they also understand, unless we get the security relationship figured uh, uh, under control, then we're going to have these cultural and these economic frictions that are very much not in their interest. So I think they see clearly how damaging this is. Now, you're right. It's going to depend on what Xi Jinping and those around him decide. And China's always been very closed about its security apparatus. So I don't think it's a certainty, but, you know, it's like a, it's like a diagnosis. You've got to, first of all, figure out what the problem is. Is there anything we can do about it? I hope so. Well, I, I, it's very encouraging that you've identified the one issue that really should take uh, front, uh, you know. Right, and I would say, yeah. though, there is a number two. Yes. And that's, let's apply the law of economics to dealing with China. Mm -hmm. That would be my second abbreviated rep. With real math. <laughs> With real math. Okay. <laughs> With real principles that doesn't hurt us more than them.
So, uh, you know, on the defense question, before we go to the questions here, uh, we recently had Taylor Fravel on stage ah. here, and he's written really a, a spectacular book on mm -hmm. security studies and has looked at the evolution of China's military doctrine since the days of the Red Army through mm -hmm. the PLA and its current uh, permutation and, and its expression on the world stage, but also domestically. And it's a fascinating book. I think it's called Active Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, he's, uh, and he's really quite a good scholar if you, you care to listen to this. He's at MIT mm -hmm. these days. Uh, so what we usually do at this stage of the program is I jump to questions because I'm sure I missed things that people are interested in here. And um, well, here it is. Uh, the first question that comes from the, f from the floor here is, what are China's main problems? It's a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that is a really uh, good question because it leads to something we haven't talked about yeah. and something that's very important. And that is so often we are a kind of, I don't mean just we, but c countries are sort of threat oriented. They pay a lot more attention to the capabilities of somebody they're worried about than they do their problems because it's the capabilities that presumably can hurt you, right? Yes. Uh, and that leads us to basically often overestimate the other guy because we're discounting all their problems. That was the right? problem in Iraq, as you right. recall. Yes. <laughs> right. So China's got a boatload of problems. And my basic strategic kind of thought on this is no American in his or her right mind would trade China's problems for ours. That, that, that's just sort of the most basic. So then what are the problems? And I, this isn't exhaustive, but uh, demographics. Mm -hmm. China is by 2040 going to be an older society than us. And let us say, just in round numbers, what are we, 50,000 per capita GDP, China, depending on the numbers, let's just say 10,000. So China is going to be a lot poorer than us when it's a lot older than us. And look at all of the problems we have, financing, Social Security, Medicare, chronic disease, taking care of old people, Alzheimer's. I mean, just go down the list. Sure. And this is baked into the cake. This is going to happen. Okay, that's issue one. And if they spend through the roof on military... They're bound by the budgetary realities pretty much like everybody else. Now, China actually is only spending about 2%, as nearly as we can tell, of GDP, and we're at about 3.8 or something like that. So they've got room to grow. But ultimately, they're going to face resource constraint. And their growth rate's dropping because the bigger your economy gets, the higher you are on the technological curve, then it becomes harder and harder to keep a high growth rate. Uh, and China's, so it's going to have aging population, falling growth rate, and, uh, and it's going to have to reallocate resources. When your budget, as China's has been growing, as I said, 9.8% for 40 years, right. you know, growth can solve a whole lot of problems. It papers over all the problems. You just throw a little money this way and that way, and you, you can manage it. But when you're into rising expectations and lower growth, and aging and more demand, you've got a problem. So that nexus of problems is there. Uh, certainly there's the whole basket of, of uh, we'll say, environment problems and global warming and, and climate change. And China will be much more affected by, as we, our models currently understand it, by climate change than we will. Mm -hmm. So they've got, they're going to have to make big, uh, you know, what you would call uh, uh, adaptation investments along its huge coast. And then, of course, there'll be change in rainfall patterns and everything else. So China's got a big climate change problem. I would say, I don't know, maybe doesn't make sense to say bigger than ours, <laughs> but in many respects, it's going to be a serious adjustment, a problem for them. So I think that's a, a third thing is, China's government doesn't do what is the most fundamental responsibility, or let's say one of the top responsibilities, is succession. Mm -hmm. What happens when the top leader dies or is pushed out or whatever befalls them? Uh, there is no accepted institutional 
succession pattern in China. I mean, we're, 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 since 1949 to now, they haven't solved what I take to be one of the fundamental problems. They were on the track of doing so with a two-term sure. two norm, yes. but the current guy has done away with that right. norm. So what it ends up is succession becomes bare-knuckle struggle, and nobody can have any confidence about that. So there's a second, a third, third. set of problems. <laughs> yeah, right? so old and poor, <laughs> getting older and poor yeah. uh, in relative terms, yeah. right? right? Pollution. Right. And, and now change. succession. And, and climate change. And all succession. This. So those are three. Um, but, you know, food is never uh, food I, I've always put on the list for China because China's leaders do. One of the wonderful, I think, things that happened in engagement period was China had enough confidence in us to import huge quantities of food. It's the biggest food sales market for the United States prior to this recent uh, dust up. And China accounts for two thirds in the, since about 1990, uh, two thirds of the reduction in hunger in the world and malnutrition. And much of that is because China made the strategic d decision to depend on the world for food, not just itself. Right. But if we get all tangled up like this, of course, the Chinese will turn to Brazil and yes. Canada and Australia. But the long and the short of it is, I don't think the Chinese ever take food security for granted. And when they're dependent on foreigners, they're basically, but they can't supply their own food. Now China's got a huge uh, set of problems on uh, pork uh, yes, and uh, the, dying the, herds the, the of Africa swine. swine and, yeah. flu, is that right? These are all extremely big things. And so when the U.S. you know, starts throwing tariffs on things and then they have to retaliate in food, this is a problem for them. So I would say China has become very interdependent and is now kind of worried if the U.S. adopts a strategy of decoupling. This is really very... I'm not sure it's very feasible, but it is very threatening. And you use that term decoupling because yeah. others have used that yeah. term decoupling right. within the U.S. government, but also in the Chinese government in terms of exactly. how do they deal with the current tensions, the current realities, and the current threats right. that exist uh, in the relations between they, the they United States. They call it self-reliance. We call it decoupling. Yes. It's an old Mao idea. Well, yes, that and Gwyneth Paltrow in her conscious decoupling is, I think, the way that we should think about it in the United States. Uh, so I'll, I'll go to another one of the questions here, and it won't be so much the question of how, what are the domestic issues, but rather um, some of the things that are happening. Well, it, actually, I'm sure the PRC would consider this a, perhaps a domestic question. It's the question of Taiwan. Oh, uh -huh. and, um so one of the questioners says, what is the impact of Taiwan's upcoming presidential elections on the U.S.-China relationship? And then secondarily, I have another questioner who also has a uh, Taiwan question, and that is, how do those in Taiwan interpret what's going on in Hong Kong, and how should they look at it to understand their predicament or their, or their challenges and perhaps their future? Well, this is the core issue that confronted Nixon and Kissinger when they went, went to China in 71 and President Nixon in, in 72. And it is no less sensitive in our relationship now than then. It's probably the single most uh, incendiary issue capable of mismanagement that could, it, it, the pathway to conflict is quickest through Taiwan. Let's put it that way. It's the most um, sensitive issue. Uh, so that's sort of point one. The last part of the question I'll tackle first, and that is how do people in Taiwan look at what's happening in Hong Kong? That's a very good question, because actually the whole notion of what the Chinese call one country, two systems, that's the ruling framework for the special administrative region of Hong Kong relating to the People's Republic of China. It was sort of how they can be a part of China, but not day-to-day -day governed by China. Uh, and that, that idea Deng Xiaoping had originally for Taiwan. Mm -hmm. But then he got in these negotiations with Margaret Thatcher, and he took an idea, one country, two systems, that was developed for Taiwan, and implemented it in Hong Kong. Mm 
So it's always been out there that the, the model that's un, uh, unfolding before our eyes in Hong Kong is the Chinese proposal for what, how they would manage Hong, uh, Taiwan right. if they reunified. Uh, and of course, as the riots and demonstrations and dissatisfaction have increased, this is a, this is a negative model as far as Taiwan's concerned. Right. So I hesitate. There are you know 23 plus million people on Taiwan. There's some difference of views, but I would say the people who have any faith in one country, two systems model in Taiwan must be a rounding error. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not even close to a mainstream idea. Right. So, and everything every day pushes the people of Taiwan away. And of course the Chinese, the more the Taiwan people have this sort of sense of separate identity, and there are polls that track their identity and basically more Taiwanese identities going up and Chinese identity is going down. Uh, and this, of course, uh, worries the PRC because they're losing the hearts and minds. Well, they didn't necessarily have them, but they're not getting more of them, and in fact, fewer. So right. this, so this brings out again. the worst impulses in Beijing. Right. So they pay attention and they try to keep countries from, certainly from recognizing Taiwan, but take countries away that do currently recognize Taiwan. They are now putting more military pressure on, on Taiwan. They've cut the quota of tourists going from the mainland to Taiwan to put economic pressure on. And of course, this just alienates Taiwan people more. But all of those frustrations, identity differences, uh, one country, two systems not panning out, the one thing that Taiwan can't change, well, two things. One is geography, 95 miles. Yes. And, uh, and the U.S. is very far away. And, uh, you know, I, I would just ask, you know, the audience, everybody's opinions as good as mine on this, is do, do we th are we in the national mood to get entangled in a Taiwan Straits in Broglio with the PRC? And I think... As we're recording this during the week when we're withdrawing from Syria, yeah. the answer becomes self-evident. Well, uh, <laughs> at best, you can say not certain. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, that's the most optimistic yes. you could be. So uh, the, the, given that they have their inclinations in Taiwan, but there is this reality, and given their biggest patron is, un from their point of view, not fully predictable, mm -hmm. uh, they've got to be careful. And so, uh, actually, Madam Tsai Ing-wen is the current president. I've met her and known her for many years. Uh, she's a very, she has a great commitment to, I think, a, a dignified uh, in, uh, identity for Taiwan and a freedom of action in the world. But uh, she's also cautious. And so I think she's, uh, she's much more cautious than her predecessor, Chen Shui, well, there's a previous Ma Ying Zhou, who was actually quite liked, relatively speaking, on the mainland. But the prior person was, uh, he couldn't even get along with George W. Bush, who was very pro-Taiwan. Yes. And he, he alienated the U.S. because he was too, I will say, incautious yes. in dealing with the mainland. So uh, I think what we have is a cautious, fairly cautious president in Taiwan. That's good for us. Uh, but uh, there is no resolution on the, the horizon. I would just say one other thing, though, is uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China and the uh, general secretary, uh, gave a speech at the 19th Party Congress, which happened in late 2017. And uh, he said that the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation will happen in 2049. Reunification with Taiwan is part of the great rejuvenation. And the unspoken third clause was, therefore, Taiwan will be reunified before 2049. Uh, now, the Chinese now have at least indicated to me maybe it isn't quite so rigid. Mm -hmm. But the point is that China, I think, is becoming more impatient for reunification and it will vary the degree of impatience, presumably, on a lot of conditions, including who's leader of China. 
Right. But what's the United States going to do if China starts to put the heat on Taiwan? And this is this is the sleeping time bomb. Well, and as the questioner pointed out, there's also an election. While things may seem cautious and stable at this moment politically on Taiwan, there are candidates who also are running in this election who have a very different orientation towards the relationship with Beijing, uh, who may, in fact, make inroads. It doesn't seem so, perhaps now, a few months out from the election, but elections and campaigns take interesting turns. Right. And so um, there is the potential, and I think that's what's implicit in this question, mm -hmm. that perhaps that relationship, either because of hyper-nationalism within Taiwan or the opposite, which is hyper-accommodation, right. could evolve by the time we get to January. You're right, electoral systems, almost anything is conceivable and everything's fluid, so we have to say that. Um, but if I look at an, uh, the range of candidates that I perceive as even remotely on the, it is not a full spectrum from those who want independence to those who want to reunify tomorrow. Mm -hmm. This is a very truncated spectrum. It goes from those who want independence to those who would uh, reassure China about the status quo. I think it. I, I don't think there's any significant group mm -hmm. in Taiwan that favors reunification in any remotely conceivable time frame. Um, great. So what's uh, so someone named Josh Lin, who's here in the audience, asks, what's the path forward strategically in the medium longer term between engagement, as he frames it, and containment? So two, he, mm -hmm. he, he creates that that spectrum, uh, given economics versus national security, right? So, um, so how does that evolve? Um, I, as you know, I was a part of a report that, that talked uh, about uh, essentially a post-engagement environment advocating for constructive vigilance with uh, the People's Republic of China. But, um, but that, is not, uh, that does not give up on engagement. It just... Uh, adds a feature to engagement uh, that perhaps was lacking in the past. But we're certainly beyond the containment phase, aren't we? Right. Well, you know, if you think back containment in the Cold War and how the U.S. ran containment against China during the 50s and 60s, really till Nixon, uh, it was premised on uh, we would not trade with China. Uh, and it, I had my passport, and it had a list of prohibited countries. China was on that list of prohibited countries. Um, you had to prove, if you went to Asia, that what you bought there wasn't from China. I mean, you had to have receipts uh, uh, and so forth. So we had an economic containment, uh, first of all. Secondly, we had uh, nuclear devices of various descriptions let us say, in proximity to China. We threatened China uh, at least on two and probably three occasions with the use of nuclear weapons. Um, not only that, the two biggest wars of the Cold War were fought either in Korea directly against China or Vietnam actually directly too, because China had some troops in yes. North Korea, but certainly proxy-wise in Vietnam. Proxy -wise in Vietnam. Yep. So... Uh, that we we had a sort of real estate, no further expansion, and we put um, troops and lives, fifty thousand and plus in both Korea and fifty thousand plus in Vietnam. Uh, so we certainly did that. We had zero Chinese students in American university schools exchange, um, and so that's what we meant by containment then. Now, on all of those fronts, I mean, is it uh, feasible to have no trade with China? And I suppose if you ended up in a 
conflict, I mean, a shooting war, then lots of things. But short of that, first of all, it isn't just the U.S. that trades simply back and forth so we make a decision, right? right? We're involved in global production chains. And in fact, the biggest value added to goods from China is from Taiwan and Korea and Singapore and Japan. They're all our friends. They're not going to cooperate in this unless they are very threatened to a much higher degree uh, than they are. Uh, and then you have many people in both China and the United States that gained from engagement. I mean, intellectuals. I just read Xi Jinping apparently sending his daughter back to Harvard. At the same time, he's running a policy, you know, that's not real friendly. Yeah. So uh, what I say is you've got lots of cross-cutting obligations here. So I don't think containment, as, 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 uh, as we thought about it in the Cold War, is remotely feasible unless the security thing goes so far south. Right. Then once you start about survival, then everything else pretty much falls out out of the equation. But I, I don't b believe we need to end up in that, and I don't think, frankly, we will. Therefore, I'd, I think we're going to be strung out trying to irritate each other, aggravate each other, give, send them signals, but not uh, end up in a, a sort of containment framework. So I, I think we will have engagement with China. The question is how efficient, uh, how broad, and does it help us improve the security relationship? And just to sort of close out this, uh, this part of our program, you know, one of the things that you've talked about that really reinforces your perspective on this and really your advocacy for this interrelationship is uh, a phrase you used that sort of keyed off of what Madeleine Albright once hmm. used to say. She once called the United States the indispensable nation. Uh -huh. uh, you call the relationship the, and the relationship with China, you call China the indispensable partner. At least you have. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know that I said that tonight. No, you didn't yeah. tonight. But I think that this is an interesting um, frame that, in fact, we just have to recognize the reality of globalization despite President Trump's recent United Nations speech about the end of globalization, um, that, in fact, you're pointing out that it is, in fact, the reality that it is so evolved, so complex, as long as we're able to stay in a, in a security environment that mm -hmm. allows for nations to interact and to trade, then in fact we are getting further bound and should be further bound with each other. I think I uh, agree with 99% of that frame. I would just say uh, it's an indispensable partner. Um, but not an inevitable partner. That things could go desperately wrong. Um, and that phraseology, partner, actually came out of the Clinton era and Jiang Zemin, and I'm sure I've said partner many times. I, I don't recall having used it recently because it's just so far beyond expectations here. And the Chinese themselves have defined our policy towards them as one of containment. So even if we sort of say, well, I remember I went to China with James Schlesinger, former defense secretary and CIA, and a Chinese person says, you're trying to contain us. And he said, that he's passed away, so I'll, I'll I hope I'm not doing violence to what he had to say. Um, containment, you haven't seen what containment is. <laughs> and then he ticked through what the elements were, including you know, nuclear deterrence, absolutely no trade, no investment, no intellectual exchange. And he says, we are so far from that policy. In fact, we've helped China in its key aspects of my intellectual modernization, technological, agrarian, right? We are so far, but the Chinese, I think, see us heading in what they are defining as a containment direction. And of course, if that's how they understand it, that's how they're gonna react. 
And I'm a great believer in, you know, it's like when you have children in the back seat of the car and Johnny gives a little nudge to Sally and Sally hauls off and hits him and then, you know, pretty soon it doesn't matter actually who started it. It's just, <laughs> and this is the kind of reaction that I, I see. But if you think of all the big problems in the world, feeding people, we haven't had any wars with China in, since Nixon went, right? That's a huge thing. We, they cooperated on Iran. Now our current government did away with the Iran deal, so I guess we can debate about that. Uh, it signed climate, can't deal with climate without China and the U.S. We need other people too. So it seems to me for our own global welfare and our own country's welfare, both countries, we need to find a way to up the quotient of cooperation and partnership. Uh, but we're not going to be partners in the comprehensive sense for quite a long time, I'm afraid. Professor Lampton, thank you very much. This brings us to the end of the radio uh, portion of our program.